All right, we are on the air. Um, welcome everybody to Code Mentor Office Hours for today. Um, we have a really awesome session lined up for today, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, for anyone uh, who might be co coming in as the session starts, if you're if you're seeing this on the couple minute delay in the Office Hour uh, event page, um, just mute yourself as you come in. But my name is Mark Plotkin, and uh, today we have uh, Benjamin Entz as our guest. And uh, we're really excited uh, to have Benji on. Um, in terms of format, I'll give him a short introduction here. And then uh, he's going to uh, take over with a presentation on um, iOS game development. Um, so uh, Benji started developing for the iOS platform in 2011. Um, he's worked on a variety of projects from enterprise apps to mobile games, and he's written about graphics programming in WebGL and 2D game development with Sprite Builder and Coco's D 2D. He's interested in software design and quality, and at Make School, he educates the next generation of software engineers. Um, so we're really excited to have him today and dig into iOS game development. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to him. Hey, Mark. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm very happy to talk to you guys today and to give you an introduction to game development. Um, so I'll, short, I'll switch over to presentation, and then I'll give a short introduction of this. It's a little bit lengthier, so you have an idea what my background is. So I'll start sharing the slides. Cool. Can you see the slides, Mark? Is that working? Yeah. Great. OK. So my name is Benjamin Enz. I started with iOS development back in 2011. And as Mark mentioned, I started developing enterprise applications. So it's a very different field from game programming um, that I saw there. Then about one and a half years ago, I joined Make School. And Make School is a company that teaches game development and software development. And that's where I started working with Coco City and Sprite Builder. Um, for those of you who don't know Coco City, it's basically still the most popular game engine on iOS. It was actually around before SpriteKit, and that is now basically the official Apple framework. And SpriteKit also takes a lot of ideas from Coco City. Uh, what is great about Coco City is that it is open source, and with a company called Portable, it's also possible to write games on iOS, but port them to Android and run natively there. So that's one of the main reasons why we're currently sticking with Coco City as the 2D game engine for, for iOS. A couple of great games also have been made with Coco City. Um, one great example is Badland. that won a design prize for Apple. So it's definitely a very popular, well-maintained game engine. Another tool that we're using a lot is uh, the tool Sprite Builder. And you can imagine that if you heard about Unity before, it's very similar to Unity, but for 2D games. That means um, it allows you to create game content, to create levels, um, and to do all of that visually without writing code for the game content part. That means when you build a game with Sprite Builder and Coco City, you have a very nice separation of your content. That means the levels and all different menus, for example, and the core game mechanics. And you only have to code the mechanics in, in Xcode, but you'll do um, a lot of content development in Sprite Builder. That makes it really easy to bring on people that have less experience in coding and let them design um, parts of your game, for example. Um, yeah, so when I joined Make School, I started getting involved in the Sprite Builder and Coco City community. On our website, we have actually a lot of tutorials on iOS game development. So if you're just getting started, then that's a good place to check, check out free tutorials. Um, as part of my effort, I also created the first version of the Sprite Builder and Coco City documentation, which is also hosted on our website. So if you're just getting started with iOS de development, we have a bunch of resources at makeschool.com. Maybe going to talk about that in the end a little bit more. For the talk today, um, the title is Best Practices and Patterns. And my idea was to target people that are interested in game development, haven't really started with it yet, and want to hear some best practices and tips. So through the couple of um, one and a half years that I spent now teaching people game development, I realized a couple of gotchas and problems that people run into. And I collected a list of what I think are five very important things to know before you get started to avoid some common mistakes. So my, my presentation is basically called Five Best Practices for Game Development. And not all of these are very specific for iOS, but some, some of them are a little bit. But one thing you realize when you start with game development that it's pretty platform agnostic. So a lot of the concepts also apply to PC games or browser games. So one that is more specific to mobile than others is a very important one that I want to start with, 
and that is a best practice called don't make assumptions about the screen size. So a lot of people, when they start out with game development, um, they will, I'll show you that on the next slide, they will have constants, for example, for the screen width. Um, on an old iPhone, iPhone 4, before all the different sizes came out, the only resolution or only screen size we had was 480 and 320. That means you could make assumptions about the size of the screen, and you could code that into constants, and then use these constants um, to position things on your screen. So a lot of, especially of the unexperienced developers that we taught in the beginning um, would do that, and then some, something happened. The iPhone 5 came out with a different screen size, and all of their games needed an entire redesign to work on multiple uh, screen sizes. So now, with this current state on the platform, even for iOS, we don't have that many different devices, but we have enough different devices that you definitely can't make assumptions about how big the screen is. You should always place things relative, um, relative to, the, to the screen size and not make hard-coded assumptions about the screen size. So if you see a uh, code, like in the first example, where you have a constant for the screen width, and then you calculate a uh, position for an object on the screen based on that, that is usually a very bad practice. Instead, you have to think about what is the right um, value that basically corresponds to the screen size. In Coco CD, for example, that would be the content size property on a scene. So each scene has a content size property, and if you, for example, have a full screen um, scene, then that content size property will be the full screen size. But it can also happen that your scene is smaller than, than the full screen. Either way, if you want to place a button relative to that scene, then you should calculate the position based on the content size. So that's just a very simple example. Um, don't use constants to declare width or height. Calculate the things relative um, based on scenes or nodes or whatever, you, whatever is relevant for your specific example. So that's really important to keep in mind. That will save you a lot of time of redesigning your game for different device types, for running on iPad, iPhone 6, iPhone 5, and so on. Good news is that Sprite Builder and Coco CD have some good support for such relative layouts. And that, that makes it pretty easy once you start thinking about it to actually implement a, a very flexible design. So beyond that very basic rule, um, there's another thing to think about. And that's basically I like to divide the things that I show on the screen into two categories. The one are UI components, such as buttons um, or a HUD, for example, that shows the current points in the game. And the other one is the actual gameplay. So at the bottom here in the slide, I've got a schematic example. Um, we basically have two different screen sizes. On the left, we have a really wide screen. On the right, we have a square one. What you can see is the way I want to lay out the scene is that the UI components are always placed relative to the screen corners. So I want the buttons and the HUD to always be on the top right and top left. doesn't matter which screen size I have. That's really important. So in most cases, it's the best practice to just lay out your eye components relative to corners. And you'll see that whatever way you resize this game, it still will look pretty good. For the actual gameplay, how that responds to different screen sizes, that really depends on the type of game that you have. Here in the bottom example, I assume that we have kind of a jump and run game. And what you can do there is actually, on a smaller device, show a smaller portion of the game. So it really depends on your game, but in many cases, it's very acceptable that a player only sees a smaller fraction, and they probably won't hurt the gameplay too much. Um, other problems can occur when you have games like puzzle games, for example, with a fixed grid size. Then that approach at the bottom won't work. What you usually have to do in that case is you have to design your game to work on the smallest screen size possible. So for example, if you have a, if you have a 9 by 9 grid, you want to make sure that that 9 by 9 grid is, works nicely on the iPhone 4, which is the smallest screen size. And then you can think about, um, on larger screen sizes, for example, on iPhone 6, how can you use the additional space to provide some additional information that is not necessary for the core gameplay. So a couple of things you could do is just display everything larger on a larger screen. But you could also have some additional information on the screen about the current game that is not essential for the gameplay, but it's nice and people can benefit from having a larger screen. So typically, the key takeaways are UI components are always placed relative to reference corners, um, to the left top, left right, for example, uh, bottom right, bottom left. So you don't want to place them at hard-coded positions, but always relative to the closest corner, as shown in this example. And for the gameplay, if it's a side-scroller, then probably you can just have a smaller portion of the game being visible. If it's something like a puzzle game where this, 
the relevant gameplay has the same size, uh, for example, a 9x9 grid, then you want to think about solutions that work on a smaller screen size and then think about how you can use additional screen size on larger devices. So that basically concludes number one. And it's really important. That sounds obvious, but you'll realize once you start working on a game, um, you want to get the idea out there really fast. You want to build a first version. And you won't always think about uh, design that is relative to the screen size. So just keep that in mind as you, as you start building games. So the second one is a, maybe a little bit um, more abstract one. And it's called separate game mechanics from game content. So this is a little bit more of a design pattern. And that is one of the ways that I suggest um, our students to separate um, two really different parts of your game. So what are game mechanics and what are game content? If you think about, for example, a platformer game, um, so a jump and run where you can control a character, you can jump on different types of blocks, similar to, like, for example, Mario, then the game mechanics would be the gravity that is applied to the player, um, the movement of the enemies, um, the user input, for example, so that the user can control the character. All of these things are game mechanics. Game content, on the other hand, would be all the different types of levels that you have in a game. So if you build a game with 20 levels, you're going to have a lot of different game content, but the game mechanics for each of these levels will be the same. And if you start without thinking about game design or software design extensively, and you start out building such a game, you will often end up with a not ideal design. And that's why I want to show you um, what I think is a good way to separate these two things. So I say game mechanics should be modeled in code. So everything that is controlling user input, everything that is defining the gameplay, um, that is basically the gameplay that is the same for all different types of levels. As I said, gravity or player input or getting scores when you kill an enemy or dying when you collide with an enemy, all of these are game mechanics. And all of that should be in code. But everything else should not be in code. So for example, if you have 20 different levels, you don't want to have all of these levels to be modeled in code. What a lot of people will do is they will start with a prototype of a game, and they will have their game code and their level code in the same file, because that's just the easiest way to start off. So you, level, you create all of your level in code, and you have the game mechanics in code. And then when these people want to add another level to the game, what they basically do is copy that file that has the game mechanics and the level relevant code and create a second level that also has the game mechanics in there. And then you'll end up with something like shown on the left side here on this slide, um, where you have all your levels are actually code files and not resource files. And all of them have duplicate code that have the game mechanics in there. So every level would basically apply gravity. Every level would know what happens when an enemy collides with a player. Um, yeah, that results in a lot of duplicate code. So that is one of the things, in general, in software engineering you want to avoid. Because if you want to change one aspect of your gameplay, for example, you want to increase the gravity, then you will have to go through all these level files and change it all over the place. That is something you want to avoid. Um, you want to get to a situation that you can see on the right side, where all of your game mechanics are implemented in one gameplay file, most typically. If you have a really complex game, you could break it up. But typically, you have one gameplay file. And then your levels are just resource files. That means they're just collection of, of different positions of game objects. I can show you that on the next slide. Um, so for example, in Sprite Builder, you can place different images all over the screen to create levels. And this here is a level from an example game that I created during a game jam. And what you can see here is basically an entire playable level. But all of this is just a resource style. It's just a file that stores the position of enemies and stores the position of different blocks um, for this one level. I can create hundreds of levels and place the blocks differently, but none of these levels actually know about the game mechanics. They don't know how physics are applied. They don't know what happens when a player collides with one of these enemies. So I really have a strict separation of, on the one hand, I create my levels in Sprite Builder, where I just lay out different positions of blocks. And then in, game, in the game code, I load one of these levels. And then I, inside of that, when I loaded that level, then I apply the game mechanics. So for example, when I loaded the level, um, then I spawned a player. And if the player collides with a block, then I know that the player should not fall to the ground. Or if the player collides with an enemy, then I know that the game should restart. All of that happens in code. All of the level design happens in Sprite Builder. And then I get to that situation where I have game mechanics only modeled once. And 
each level only represents um, a, basically a different visual arrangement of different objects. That is where we want to go. Um, for another different type of game, for example, a puzzle game um, or a quiz game, you maybe have content that is not structured in this visual way, so you don't really have a level that you can draw out. But instead, you have, for example, a set of different questions and answers. And on iOS, there's a great file type that you can use to model that, and that is called a plist. So that would be another way to model your game content as a resource and not in code. So instead of having one source file where you hard code all the questions for your game and all the answers, you actually want to have a resource file that has questions and answers. Um, another example that I'm showing here in that slide is a game where I basically spawn objects that fall from the top of the screen to the bottom, and the player has to collect these objects. And I have two different types of objects. One are the one the player should catch, and the other ones are the one the player should avoid. So instead of putting all of this into code, I decided to take a resource file and define which assets represent good objects and which assets represent bad objects directly in here. And the advantage of that is that it's really easy to change for me. So if I want to add new assets or replace them, I just have to go into a resource file, and I don't have to touch code and think about potential side effects. And I could also have a designer or a game designer on my team working entirely on these resource files without touching my code base and still changing the game behavior. So that's a pretty uh, cool concept. And it's also one of the things you think about pretty early. How can I, basically, what is my game mechanics? What, are, what represents my game content? And how can I separate these two? And then what is a good way to represent the content of my game? Either maybe as sprite builder level files, or as Unity level files, or as, in this example, as structured files, for example, plist. So that concludes number two. Um, number three is one that is a very specific one um, to game development. It's not really a general software development principle. It's called use the update loop for time-dependent actions. So just in case we have some folks that are totally new to game development, um, the update loop is a concept in every game engine that is basically like a global timer that decides how often the game is rendered to the screen of the device. So for example, on iOS, when you work with Coco City, your entire game is drawn to the screen 60 times a second. And all of that is triggered by the update loop. So it's kind of this internal timer that triggers all the game events to, um, to happen. And then after everything is calculated as new position, after collisions have been calculated, and so on, it renders the current frame to the screen and does that 60 times a second. So it's kind of this internal clock for all timed actions in a game. Now, in many games, you want to have your own timed actions. For example, I mentioned this game where objects fall from the top of the screen, and uh, the player has to catch these objects. So a typical thing that you want to do in such a game is spawn an object every couple of seconds. So let's say every two seconds, you want to spawn a new object. One thing you want to avoid is creating a new timer to spawn these objects. So if you wouldn't work with a game engine, um, what you would probably do on nearly any other platform, you would create some timer object and that timer object would fire every two seconds, and then you would spawn this object. If you are working with a game engine, you don't want to create your own timer, but you want to integrate. The reason is that if your game is really complex, or if the device is a little bit slow that your game is running on, then the rendering speed can actually change. And you've probably seen that when you play games. They don't always run necessarily at a constant 60 frames per second. Sometimes they can slow down. And if that happens, then the update loop, the clock, also slows down. That means all timed actions in your game get called less often when, when the frame rate of your game drops. So if you would provide your own timers, then these timers would still run at a regular speed, while your game would be running at a slowed down speed. And then your actions get out of sync. So we've seen that happen um, for some type of games, and that's why I put it on here. Um, it's really important, don't use your own timers use the timer that is provided by the game engine and hook into there. And for example, in Kirkus DB, there are some really easy ways to do that. Um, so it's not really a technical challenge. It's just something to be aware of. If you use your own timers, you're going to risk that your, your specifically timed actions gets out of sync with the core timer of the game and the game engine. OK, so this one is a pretty, pretty simple one. Um, I've written up a tutorial about this talk that I'm currently giving, and I put it up on our website. 
And that shows some more specific code how you can actually implement that in Cocoa City if you were to set up your custom timer. OK, so it's not too complicated. Number four, and that is more of a design pattern um, that really goes into code design. And it's called Use Composition to Build Complex Objects with Shared Behavior. So that sounds very abstract, but I'm going to go into a, a nice example that should probably point out um, why this pattern is useful. So let's think about a game where we have 20 different enemy types. So it's just some side scroller, for example, and we have enemies that behave in a different way. And they have a bunch of characteristics. Some enemies, for example, can jump. Um, some of the enemies can go into double speed mode sometimes and move at, a, at double the speed than usual. Some of them can be immortal for a certain time. And you just have a big bunch of different characteristics. And each enemy type has a set of these characteristics. For example, here I, I showed three of these 20 enemy types. Um, enemy type 2, for example, can jump. Enemy type 1 can jump, can move at double speed, and can turn immortal. And enemy type number 3 can move at double speed and can turn immortal, but cannot jump. So if you start with a classical design pattern, you would probably um, try to think, what, what is the base enemy type? What is the shared behavior between these, different, uh, these 20 different types? And then you would try to create this base enemy type and create 20 subclasses um, of that base type that add their own specific characteristics onto this base enemy. The problem is, when you look at a simple example here, um, that you'll get enemy types that have certain functionality in common, but then again, other functionality not. So for example, jumping is a, is a feature that is shared between enemy type number one and enemy type number two. But you couldn't really think of a great inheritance structure where you can have these 20 different enemy types inherited from each other in a way that there is no functionality implemented as duplicate. For example, in this case, you could try to make enemy type 1 the subclass of enemy type 2, because both of them have to jump. Then enemy type 1 could just add double speed and immortal. But that wouldn't work for all cases of these 20 enemies. So if you just have that big matrix of different features um, that, a, that an enemy type can have, and you want to model that with a class hierarchy, that becomes pretty difficult. And a lot of people ran into this problem in game development before. And they came up with, with a pattern to solve that. And that's called a component pattern. You can look at that on the next slide. So instead of having a hierarchy where we have different subclasses of base enemy for the different combinations of moving at a certain speed or the different features that an enemy can have, we can actually extract these features into entirely separate classes. So actually, every feature an enemy could have would be one class. For example, moving at double speed or jumping or becoming immortal. And each of these classes would implement only this one specific feature. So for example, the jump one, uh, the jump feature would take the user input. If the user tapped the screen, then it would move the enemy up to a certain direction or apply a certain velocity. And that would be encapsulated only inside of this jump class. And now if you want to create an enemy that has certain characteristics, you can just create one instance of the space enemy and add these different components on top. So for example, you can say, I want a base enemy that has double speed behavior and jump behavior. And that way, you can avoid duplicate code. Because if you have one enemy type that can uh, move at double speed and can jump, then you can easily create it by uh, combining these two components. And you can also reuse the same jump component for a second enemy type that can jump and be immortal. So each of, the, uh, each of these features their code is unique. You don't have the duplicated code that you've seen in the example before. I hope this is more or less clear. If not, I'm happy to answer questions right now or at the end of the talk. So how does it look like in code when you create an object using these components and what we call composition? That I'm showing you at the top, in the top example. So let's say we want an enemy that can jump and can become immortal. Then we would create this jump component we would create the immortality component. And then as we create the enemy, we would pass these two components in. And one question you might have is, how are these components implemented? And there's no real silver bullet. Um, I've linked to an article 
in, in the tutorial that I wrote for this talk um, that discusses really in depth the different ways how you could implement these components. One common way is that every component to the object that it belongs to. So going back to the slide before, double speed jump an immortal, as, the, as they get added to an enemy, they will get a reference to this enemy. And then the enemy will have some sort of public variables that can be modified by the components. For example, if you want to make the enemy jump, then it requires that the jump action has access to the velocity of the enemy so that it can actually change the vertical velocity and make the object jump. So the way that is typically implemented is there is a public variable velocity on the base enemy, and the jump action gets a reference to the base enemy class and can then change this velocity from inside. So that is one way of implementing that, and it's the most uh, straightforward one. There are also more complicated ones listed in that reference. So um, what you can see, when we use composition and components in the topic sample, we have three lines of code to actually create an enemy. And if you have a more complex game, where we ha maybe have five or 10 components per enemy, then it can get a little bit um, complicated to create different enemy types across your code base. And if you compare it to the example at the bottom, where we actually have one specific subclass for each enemy type, there is a lot easier to create an enemy. You can just say, create enemy type 1, or create enemy type 5. And you don't have to know about the components that this enemy has. And um, while the composition actually is really great, the example on the top, because we now don't have duplicate code anymore, um, we still run into this little inconvenience when creating these objects. And that is what I want to address in, in best practice number five. So best practice number five is called use factoring methods to create objects that use composition. So this, again, sounds pretty complicated, but actually all I'm saying is there's an easier way to create these enemies that are, are built um, on different composite types, like jump, uh, move, double speed, immortality. Um, there's a way that we don't have to know the exact um, behaviors that we want to put into an enemy. We can just hide it behind what we call a factory method. So here's an example of a factory method on the top. Um, it's called create enemy type one, and it returns an enemy. And this function or method just knows about the components that we need to create an enemy of type number one. So it kn knows that we want a jump component, an immortality component, and then it creates an enemy that has exactly these two components. So basically all we're doing is saying we have these 20 different types of enemies, so let's create 20 methods that know how to create that enemy. So if we want to use these methods in different places in code, we actually don't have to remember the components that go in there, but we can just call this method. And this factory pattern is actually a very old pattern. It's part of the very famous design patterns book, um, but it's not too complicated. And you can also use it for different parts of your game. So basically, whenever you want to create a complex object, so an object that takes multiple lines of code to, to create it, then you can put that code into one of these factory methods. And the code that wants to create an enemy or any other type of object then just has to call this method instead of knowing all the details of how this object actually has to be created. OK. So this factory method really plays together nicely components pattern. Um, basically, it concludes more or less the five, what I believe are really important or most important things when you start off with game development. Um, for, this, for these slides, I've also put together a little written tutorial that goes a little bit more into code examples and basically has everything contained that I talked about. It's hosted on our website. If you go to makeschool.com slash tutorials, then you'll find that tutorial because it's the latest one that I just posted short before this talk. Um, yeah. Besides that, I've intentionally kept this talk um, at about 30 minutes to be able to take questions and talk about what you're interested in, maybe in iOS game development, anything that could be relevant for you or questions about my talk. So I'll switch to Q&A mode now. Awesome. Thanks so much, Benji. Um, yeah, so everyone, feel free to, uh, to chat in more of your questions. I've been collecting a few, and we actually got quite a few via email, um, probably from some people who couldn't, couldn't attend. So um, I'll, actually, I'll start with one that uh, Kevin just sent in. Um, what about just extending a base enemy object using Swift's extension facility? Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah. So 
Extensions in Swift basically allow you to add functionality to a class without creating a subclass. Um, I think it's just really a technical difference. Um, you still result in the same problem that you would have a lot of different extensions. And creating these extensions would involve still a certain amount of um, duplicate code. The problem is you can't really add these extensions on a per instance basis. So you can't create a uh, base class and then add extensions on top, but these extensions are created for, um, for all enemies, basically. So you can still only create one type of extensions. You can't really create these 20 enemy types by dynamically adding extensions on top. So extensions are just a way of extending the class somewhere else in code, but it's still only extending that one specific class. I hope that's more or less clear, but basically gotcha. yeah, he, he unfortunately he's... can't use that feature for that. Awesome. Yeah, Kevin said that was very helpful. Um, do you have any Coco's uh, 2D um, learning and example resources that, that you use or recommend besides Make School and, and Code Mentors tutorials that uh, that would that would help people or you know utilize the official Coco's 2D documents? Um, so yeah, basically, I think currently we're the main site for Coco's 2D tutorials. Um, we have something called the Online Academy. Um, that's basically kind of an online course where you go through learning Coco CD from scratch and building games with Spy Builder and Coco CD. Then under slash tutorials, we have a whole bunch of tutorials. Um, under make school slash docs, we have the official documentation. And there's also a new book out um, by Stefan Eterheim. It's called Learn Sprite Builder. Um, that's a really extensive book. has more or less 500 pages um, that focuses on teaching Sprite Builder a lot and build games with that. And I'm actually also working on a book um, that uh, will teach game development using Swift, Sprite Builder, and Coco City, which I hope to be out um, in March. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely look out for that. Um, now, how would you compare Coco's 2D and Sprite Kit? OK. Um, they're pretty similar uh, because Sprite Kit took a lot of the established concepts from Coco City. Um, I think the biggest difference at the moment is it's been around for I think at least five years on iPhone now. So another aspect is Coco City is being updated really frequently now. So a portable, the company that I mentioned earlier, has a full-time team on there with I think five or six developers, and they're pushing out new releases every two or three months. So the speed at which Coco City is moving is a little bit faster. Um, one of the adventures of Sprite Kit, on the other hand, is that it integrates a little bit better with Apple's official tools. So for example, you can use SpriteKit in Playgrounds. Um, there's some debugging tools for SpriteKit that aren't available for Coco City. Um, for me at the moment, Coco City is more mature. It's open source. And it's a little bit more responsive to community feedback. And SpriteKit is just more the official Apple way of doing things. Um, but it actually is still pretty similar. So if you pick up one of the two, it's pretty easy to switch and, and use the other framework. They're very, very similar. Sweet. Um, so I'm going to go to some of the questions that we were emailed in. They're a little bit broader um, yeah. since uh, you know people just followed the heading of, of iOS uh, game development. But yeah. you know, what do you what would you say are the major architectural differences between an iPhone app of a different nature, say like a productivity app and a traditional gaming app, like the examples you gave? That's a good question. So um, actually, there aren't too many. Um, one of the big differences is that in a game, you will mostly have all of your game logic in one place. Um, so I mentioned that typically you have a gameplay class that has the core game mechanics. And there will only be a, a few hundred lines of code. And the core business logic of the game is pretty simple. Whereas when you create an application, um, a regular iOS application that is not a game, then you're going to have a lot of different views in your game and in your app. And in each of them, you will be able to modify the state of, of your application. So for example, if you just think about something simple as a notes app, then there are different screens where you can modify notes. There are different screens where you can add them. Um, then mostly there's some component where you're going to synchronize things with internet. So you have a little bit more spread out logic. We have to think about, hey, if I change something in this part of the application, how can I how can I reflect it in a different part of the application? And you have to think about that um, information flow a lot more. In games, it's more about thinking, how can I um, reuse code, for example, to create different types of gameplay? But you have your gameplay code mostly isolated and not talking to too many other parts of, of your game. 
that's probably one of the biggest differences that I realized when um, gotcha. working on these two different types of projects. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, all right, uh, Daniel, who's actually in the session now, is wondering, um, you know, is it worth, uh, is it worth for the, in terms of initial learning, going with Objective C and then picking up Swift later, or would you recommend starting with Swift? And this is in the context of building games with Coco's 2D. Um, so we now are slowly starting to teach Swift. I still think if you really want to get invested in game development with um, for the iPhone, you should start with Objective C. Um, the main reason is Coco Studio is written in Objective C. Um, all Apple frameworks are still written in Objective C. So it's really, really helpful to understand Objective C to work with iOS. And even if you want to call Objective C code from Swift, it's, if you understand both languages, it's a lot easier to understand how you can call a certain method um, in Swift that is written in Objective C. And there will also, especially now in the first year, there will be some rare cases where Swift will not support a certain feature, and you'll probably have to fall back to Objective C code to actually accomplish some stuff. The third category of things we've seen is that Swift has some weird edge cases where the performance is really poor, and sometimes people switch to Objective C um, to work around these. So I guess for the next one or two years, I still would say if you have enough time to start with Objective C and then go to Swift, if you just want to get um, if you want to start as a small side project and don't want to get too invested, then you can also start with Swift. Gotcha. Um, getting some comments on on this topic too. You know, do you have any experience with the speed or slowness of Swift, particularly with inner loops, as compared to Objective C? Um, honestly, no. Um, there are a lot of good benchmarks out there, and most of these benchmarks tend to go in the direction to say, okay, if you take the native implementation in Swift, then it's a lot slower than Objective C. But if you tweak it a little bit, then you'll get Objective-C speed. Um, so it seems that for some ways, you have to understand the swift way of implementing a feature to actually get the old Objective-C speed. But in general, um, the two seem to be comparable. But I don't have personal experience with that. Gotcha. And another comparison question, Cocos 2DX and C++. Yeah. So yeah, Cocos 2DX is very, it was very similar to Cocos 2D iPhone at a certain point in time. Um, it's written in C++. That means it's from the ground up built for cross-platform development. Um, so you can have the same code base for your iOS game, and you can also use it for Android. In my personal experience, C++ in the beginning is a lot harder to pick up. The language is a little bit older. It um, has a lot of memory management things going on that are not that easy for beginners to, to use correctly. Um, there's not a lot of type safety. So there are quite a bunch of things in C++ that are pretty hard to pick up. And I also feel that the Cocos CD Swift APIs are a little bit better at this point. So beginning more or less a year ago, Cocos CD uh, Swift and Cocos CD X have diverged a little bit more. Um, for my personal taste, I prefer the Cocos CD Swift APIs when I look at when I compare the two. It seems that they have cleaned up a little bit more. Um, but yeah, and as I mentioned, with a portable, you can also cross compile Objective C or Swift games written in Cocos CD Swift to Android. So the whole platform development um, reasoning is not necessarily one of the main reasons to pick Cocos CDX. But I've also had more experience with Cocos CD Swift, so I probably should add a disclaimer there. And yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, yeah everyone, keep feel free to keep chiming in with questions. These are great. I'll go. I'll go back to some that were emailed in. Um, okay. All right. So I know. I know. Early on, you mentioned really not to stress about screen size customization so much, but yeah. people are just are curious. I think. You know, if you know from the get-go that you're going to focus entirely on iPhone, or you know you're going to focus entirely on tablet, um, you know, are there some core foundational things that you'll take in a different direction if you know that ahead of time? Um, yeah. So for it depends a lot on the type of game. Um, we have built games in the past that work nicely on iPad or iPhone, the like. Because if you think about a game like Mario, for example, where you just have a platform where you can jump uh, through a wall. Um, you can build that for iPhone and iPad in a very similar way. The iPad user will probably see a little bit more of the game build, or maybe it will be scaled up a little bit, but the experience is still great. Um, if you, for example, build a game like um, Words with Friends, then very likely you don't want the same experience on iPhone or iPad. Very early, we'll have to decide for one of the two platforms and then optimize your UI to really look good on that. And then if you want to add an additional platform, then you will very likely have entirely different interfaces for that. So you won't reuse the same interface. You will kind of reuse the game logic, 
and everything that is possible, but the interface for an iPad game that allows you to play um, a puzzle game, for example, will look a lot different than on an iPhone. So I would say if it's th that type of game where you know you will need very different interfaces, then focus on one from the beginning. Um, otherwise, for all other games, Sprite Builder has really great support um, to add assets that work nicely on iPad, iPhone, and all different screen sizes. And then I would recommend not cutting out one platform too early, because it's just so little added effort. And another thing we've seen is that Apple seems to like apps that are available for iPhone and iPad. Um, they seem to rank them a little bit higher in search. So if you can put an iPad version of a game up there, I would try, uh, I would try to do that. Makes sense. Yeah, Kevin's curious along the same lines. You know, what can you say about screen rotations and that relating to screen size changing? Screen rotations. So that's actually a thing that is really poorly handled by most game engines at the moment. Um, I think Character City and Sprite Kid alike don't really um, respond to screen size tra uh, changes by rotations at the moment. So there are some people that have implemented in their games with certain hacks that is not really part of the core game engine. But for Coco City, it's actually going to be changed with Coco City 4. So that's our, um, a release they want to roll out, I think, in before the summer, sometime around April. And then it will be able to actually rotate the screen and have your components on the screen respond to that change. Um, I can talk about experience how this is done on iOS for regular apps. And there is usually that you just have your interface designed as a set of constraints. For example, you say, my button is my button in top left corner is 10 points uh, from the left side of the screen and 10 points from the top edge of the screen. And then if you rotate um, if you rotate the screen, these rules get applied again, which maybe will result in your uh, components moving it a little bit, but it doesn't really mess up your interface. So the basic idea is that you set up the rules in the beginning in a way that they work for all different rotations and all different screen sizes, and then the game engine will just decide when it will reapply these rules. So at the moment, it's not possible. Um, if it starts to become possible, the rules will be the same that you, when you think about different screen sizes, you automatically also think about different screen rotations. You just make your game work in all different um, dimensions that are possible. Awesome. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, this is changing gears a little bit, talk a little bit about how you think about structuring a team for iOS game development. Um, yeah. A lot of our viewers, a lot of people on Code Mentor period are, are sort of solopreneurs, um, but are, some of them are looking to pair up with other developers. So how do you recommend they split up the work required to properly you know, architect a really great iOS game? Yeah, so I had different, uh, different experiences so far. Um, last year, for example, I went to a game jam um, and there we had two developers on the team and two designers. And I think that worked really well. So just from a kind of a business perspective, it's really important to have good-looking games. So it's really important to get a dedicated designer onto your game, um, someone who can create great art. And with Sprite Builder, I probably would even recommend if you have something like a level-based game, get someone on the team that just takes care of building these levels and testing the levels. So that means an ideal team, I would probably take one one developer who's like the core, who implements core mechanics and code. Then I would have one designer who makes the, great, the game look really polished. And then I would have one person actually creating the game content. That means creating a ton of levels, play testing these levels, and, and getting the feel of each of these levels right, if you have a level-based game. Um, similar, if you have a quiz game, for example, then probably you want one person working on the content, like questions, whatever. Um, and in most cases, I think it's good enough to have one developer working on the core gameplay. Um, some nice advantages that you get when working with two people are just the classic things, like um, you have people that can do code review. You can avoid introducing um, like fully structured code. So somewhere between one and two developers, one content creator, and one designer, I think, is, is uh, pretty good for most teams. Cool. Um, Ahmed, who's in the session, is curious about, do you have any advice for top-down view games uh, in terms of Coco's 2D, um, like Gravity would be zero? Yeah, so. exactly. So um, I actually built an example recently of just a simple Pong game. Um, so the way you have to think about it, Coco's 2D is really a pure 2D engine. So you're going to choose one perspective for your game from the beginning. You're going to stick with that, and you will have to think about how can I arrange these 2D 2D elements on the screen to make it look like, like I'm actually looking at a 3D world from one certain perspective. Um, a common example are really old games like Roller Coaster Tycoon or Age of Empires. 
there are actually 2D games, but they get a 3D look by arranging these 2D components in some sort of perspective. So in Kirby City, you can easily also build a top-down game. As you, as you mentioned correctly, you wouldn't use gravity, for example. That wouldn't work. Um, but you can use a physics engine to apply different types of forces. Um, for example, I built a Pong game, and I had physics integrated in that game, so the ball would bounce from the walls. You would look at the play field from the top. Um, but I had gravity deactivated, because it just doesn't make sense if you're looking at a table that gravity applies in any of these directions. Um, but it's all up to you. So depending on the perspective of the game, you will have to come up with code and assets that make it look real, basically. So there's no limitation on the game engine, no assumptions on the game engine side. Cool. Um, so what are some common pitfalls you're seeing with either um, porting to or from Android um, with some of these iOS games? So porting to Android, one of the most important things, that's why I mentioned at the, the beginning of the talk, are screen sizes. So most of you probably know that Android is way more fragmented than iOS. It means there are a ton of different screen sizes and screen ratios out there. Um, so it's really hard to support all of them. The first important step is using that dynamic layout system that Cocos TV provides. And that means if you have different device sizes, most of your games will look decent on them. Um, that comes kind of out of the box once you start using these tools correctly. Um, another common problem are different constraints on the hardware. So on iOS, you, it's really easy to test on these devices. And all, even the iPhone 4 is a pretty good device that can, has a big memory um, for graphics, for example. You can take big textures and put them out there. On Android, if you want to support older devices, you have a lot um, higher limitations. So you'll probably run into things like, hey, here I've got a sprite sheet um, that has a resolution of 2,000 on 2,000. It works great on my iPhone and all iOS devices, but I've got like these 20 Android devices out there that have a max text resolution of 1,024 on 1,024. So most of the times, it's just really getting these Android devices in the hand and figuring out which limitations they have, and then see, you'll just have to decide, do I want to support this device? If yes, I'll have to figure out how I can change the assets in my game. And if not, then you're just going to cut out a certain level of devices. So just the bigger limitations on Android devices um, is one of the bigger problems that you'll, that you'll face. And just the large amount of configurations. Awesome. Uh, one more question just came in, uh, a couple more. Um, Daniel, I'm just going to read this down, sorry. I uh, saw this posted on Stack Overflow a while back, but wanted to know if you're aware of any workarounds, any way to test a game I'm building on my actual iPhone without joining the $99 developer program. Well, workarounds, it depends. The best workaround is if you have a friend who has a developer account. <laughs> Obviously, I don't officially recommend doing that, since Apple wouldn't like, uh, like us talking about that. Um, in general, unfortunately, no, there's no real way. Um, the reason is um, that Apple requires every app that is on your phone to be code signed. And you can only code sign apps when you have what is called a provisioning profile that is part of your developer account. So actually running on a device is not possible easily, unfortunately. Gotcha. Gotta love Apple. But you could use, yeah. you could use a portable um, port the game to Android and run it on your Android device. So that would be one way to work around that if you have an Android device. Awesome. How would you handle the actual resource content sizes when screens are smaller, like on an iPhone versus large screens on an iPad? Yeah. Uh, would you scale them by some amount to account for a retina display, for example? Yes. So luckily, that is built into the game engine itself. Um, so how that works is typically when you build a game that supports iPad, retina, iPad, iPhone retina, and regular iPhone, then you provide assets at what is called a 4x size. And that 4x size is basically the image size that you need um, to represent the same thing in iPad Retina on, on an iPad as on non-Retina on an iPhone. That means if you have a character that has a size of 50-50 on an iPhone, then you will provide an asset of size 200-200. And that will be used on iPad Retina, and it will look more or less similar compared to the screen size. And that is typically the way how, how you scale um, assets. And that is, as I said, built into Sprite Builder and Cocos CD. So that's entirely um, automatically scaled for you. Um, we actually have a full tutorial on that on our website, where there's different ways how you can handle that. Because, because, because um, I'll be able to scale like the way how you can play. So you could imagine, you could imagine if you have an iPad game, you just want to show a huge amount of the gameplay. 
and that is a lot bigger than on an iPhone, then you could use the same assets on an iPhone Retina as on an iPad Retina. And the aspect um, ratio, what you would see of the game, would just be a lot larger. So um, for default, you provide the largest screen size as asset size possible, and Coke City will downscale it to all different devices to make it look the same size. Um, but there are also some advanced techniques that we mentioned at, at Make School on our Make School tutorials. Awesome. Other than other than Make School, are there other places online people can find your work or, or sort of follow what you're up to? Um, yeah, so I have a Twitter account um, at Benjamin Ants. I also occasionally blog on blog.benjamin Ants. Um, so I'm currently starting to build a new website because I've recently been giving a few talks I want to put up there. So yeah, if you're interested in iOS development and like design patterns around that, um, you can totally follow my blog. Awesome. Um, yeah, well, I think uh, I think we'll start to wrap up here. Um, actually, Benji, are the slides going to be available to people? Yeah. What okay, do you great. Do I usually share them? I'm happy to okay, share. great. Yeah, you know, I'll get the link from you after, and I'll send an email to great. everyone that was in this, so everyone you'll be able to get a sl copy of the slides. Um, and I, I should also mention this is actually our first. You know, we Code Manager does office hours all the time, but this is our first one. That's officially part of Makers Year. If you if you check out makersyear.com, uh, Code Manor has partnered with a bunch of amazing programs, including Make School. Um, and there's actually a, a pretty crazy discount to sign up for Make School right now if you sign up through Makers Year. So I recommend everyone check that out. And obviously, you'll get to connect more with Benji's work that way. Um, uh, but with that, um, thank you guys so much. Um, again, you know. Come to Make School or Code Mentor if you ever need any more help on your mobile apps. And um, this will be live on uh, Code Mentor's YouTube channel if you guys want to come back and watch. Um, but uh, I think with that, uh, we'll say good afternoon or good morning or evening wherever everyone else is in the world. And thank you so much to Benji. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. The email address is in the slides. Happy to help. Awesome. All right. Talk to everyone later. Signing off. Bye-bye.